Welcome to the 50th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Devika Girish. I'm one of the programmers of the festival's talk section, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very exciting conversation. We have some amazing guests with us today, as you can see on the screen, but before we get to them, I just want to make a few remarks and say some thanks. The New York Film Festival has always been about bringing the community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us in our virtual cinema or at one of our drive-in venues, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you for being a part of this historic edition. Thank you to the FLC board, patrons, members, and dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. As a nonprofit, we rely on your support, and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers, take advantage of discounts and special offers, while helping to continue sharing the best in cinema. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today. We are also very grateful to our tireless staff and volunteers working behind the scenes to make this festival happen. In addition to screenings, you can access the New York Film Festival from anywhere this year with our free virtual talk series that takes place throughout the festival. Do subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast for Q&As with filmmakers, panel discussions, and much more. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss any exciting updates or festival announcements. And join the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, including HBO, the presenting partner of all film at Lincoln Center Talks. Today's conversation will be moderated by Dennis Lim, who is the Director of Programming for the New York Film Festival. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dennis, and I'm going to let you introduce the incredible filmmaker who we are lucky to have with us today. Great. Thanks, Devika. Uh, and welcome, everybody, to this uh, talk, one of our talks, one of our deep focus talks, um, where we, will, we are lucky enough to have um, the director, Simon Liang, with us for an in-depth conversation. Um, you will be able to submit questions um, in the Q&A, uh, so, you know, please do... Um, Send us your questions um, and I will save time at the end of our hour for um, a selection of those. Um, if you are joining us now, I'm sure you already know uh, that Simon Lang is one, one of our very greatest filmmakers. Uh, I think he is one of a small handful of filmmakers whose work has truly offered us and continues to offer us new ways of seeing and new modes of feeling. Uh, his new feature, Days, is part of our main slate. Um, it's a film I've watched several times now, and I, it's a film that I would say has given me a lot of sustenance over the past year. Um, watching it again recently, especially during this strange season of isolation that we're all living through has been an especially emotional experience. If you, if you haven't yet seen Days, we have a handful of tickets left, um, and I encourage you to snatch them up. Um, you, it will be available in our virtual cinema for a few more days. And I know some people here hopefully had the chance to see days in our drive-in cinema um, on Friday night. So uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, and thank you for joining uh, Director Simon Liang and also with us uh, to interpret is Vincent Cheng. Thank you both for being with us tonight.讲述一下他这几次看了你的电影之后日子那特别是在我们现在在疫情的当中在这样每个人都关在家里的情况下面去看这部片有特别的感动高兴有这样的机会能跟你做这样的对谈那如果那些一些观众还没有看过您的片子应该赶快把票买起来去看要么是在线上看要么是到这个汽车电影院之前已经放过汽车电影院的部分那现在还有在线上有放映您的电影要
and specifically if it has changed in the last decade or so, because this is a, a very interesting period for your work in which you, you work in many different modes, um, making short films, making documentaries, making work for installation, working in the theater, making a VR piece. I'm wondering if working in all these different modes um, informed this new film and whether it also changed your idea of, of, of cinema. Yeah,刚开始我进入这个行业,当然我是科班出身的。我是学戏剧的 循着以前大家制片的方式有一块有一个门是通往美术馆的大部分是这样然后体力也付出非常多由反而变成简单的可能更自我的情况的意味多一些所以 uh, was train actually as uh, in the drama uh, theater side of the academy so so to me to enter this particular industry I thought uh, that the, the only way to make a living to survive is to follow the mode of production within this particular industry, uh, this visual entertainment uh, film industry that I was part of. And I made films, I made theater productions, I was the screen uh, writers and uh, wrote, wrote screenplays, I directed. So I very much followed the, uh, the, the modes, the conventional and the prevalent mode of production for quite 10 to 20 years uh, for quite a while. And basically, you come up with the idea for a film, and then you search for funding, and then you gather a group of people, your crew, and then you start making films. So this particular type of mode of production was very much what I have been following uh, for the past uh, one or two decades. It is not until that when my work, uh, my 
films were discovered by the art community and they started to somehow open a, another door, uh, another channel uh, for me to show my work in the art museum settings. And because of that, uh, somehow uh, I got to overcome a lot of barriers and obstacles of the, the industry pressures, the industry demands and industry limitation I faced in the past, uh, in the previous 10 to 20 years, I suddenly realized that I have another venue for me to really make very individualized film, very personal film. And I don't have to worry about things that make me very, very tired and very, very fatigued just thinking about the, the whole process, uh, the, the film market, the box office pressure, the part that I actually personally will help sell tickets uh, just to make sure that my film will be shown uh, in the cinema. So that was uh, the reason why I slowly somehow gravitate uh, away from the film industry and trying to think about what will be the other options for me to use very, very uh, low budget, little budget, and use very, very small crew and to make films that, that will not be uh, so involved in terms of its process, its sort of visual labors going from very, very complex and complicated process into something that is very pure, very simple, very personalized, very individualized. And that was the, the journeys I have taken so far. Mm. I'm curious though, if he could say a little bit about whether this has, I guess, affected the, t shaped the kinds of films that he makes um, in, in the last 10 years or so. If I'm not mistaken, Stray Dogs was presented, shown in a cinema, released in cinema, but also uh, presented as an installation. So I'm wondering, you know, if, if, if um, working in different forms uh, in the last 10 years um, has, has changed his thinking about just the possibilities of the medium. And maybe another, another thing to throw in here is um, digital, digital video. I believe Stray Dogs was the first film that um, was shot on digital and whether working with digital has also changed his, his working methods and also his idea of what, what a film should be.你不但是在电影院里面有放映你也是在艺术馆里有一个装置的这样子的作品呈现那透过像另外一个方面去想就是你尤其是在数位的在交流的时候开始用数位的方式来拍片那在这样子的不一样的拍片的方式拍片的构
呃看电影的，看各种不同的电影的哈，呃呃，所以所以他们可以，他们反而会很享受，呃，你在电影里面有一点点的改变，有一点点的创意哈，他们是可以很享受。但大体上来说，你你你的这样的情况下，你的票房都不会太好，啊，所以。呃，你自然就要承受呃这种在院线上的一种一种压力哈，啊、哦呃，我在台湾的刚,刚我提到，我就我我在台湾，因为我就生活在台湾，我我就不希望我的我在台湾我的票房是很糟的哈、哦，所以我就进行了个人到街头卖票的一个一个模式，大概进行了十几年，哦，每一次到上片，我都尽量让我的我的票可以卖出去一一万张，都是在街头卖的，啊、哦。所以，呃，但是累积下来，你发现说你根本不能累积你的观众，观众也是像流水一样来一批去一批，来一批去一批。所以我后来发现说这是一个这是一个整体对观看电影这个事情的一个教育的问题。基本上啊、呃，你不太能改变大环境哦、呃，除非是教育啊、呃，从教育的角度来进行。那我后来就发现说啊，欧、呃、欧美的观众、欧洲的观众跟亚洲的观众很大的不同点在于说啊啊、呃呃，亚洲呃亚洲的呃接受电影的的情况非常狭隘，他就是要看戏剧啊，他就是要笑娱乐啊，他就是要要要要啊、呃、要固定的元素。那欧洲的呃比较多的有各种可能的尝试，他们会去享受不同的表达啊。你你发现它的源头在哪里？后后来我我可能我的推测是，它是美术馆的概念哦，因为欧洲有大量的长期的美术馆的培培养的观众，亚洲是观众就直接就是电影院和呃和和电视培养出来，所以那个视觉的美学上面都是没有被被被养成的，所以基本上有一点你必须后来，但是这几年因为亚洲。呃，开始有很多现代美术馆的成立，哈、啊，特别在台湾，所以我就想想说，我是不是可以把我的电影放到美术馆里面去，或者我的创作有倾向美术馆的概念，让他们慢慢接受这种不太一样的影像的表达，大概是这样。So I think that a lot of things that I thought about in the past ten years. It's very much about the observers and the viewers of this particular medium we call film, and I don't. I do think that、uh, in the past and right now, for the mainstream media,、uh, mainstream viewers and observers of the film、uh, industry, they tend to have very set preconceived notions and also expectations of what they can expect and they want to see. When they go to cinema, when they go see a film, they want it to be between 90 to 100 minutes. They want it to have certain meanings, certain listen, learn from this particular film. They want to have certain narratives, certain structures, certain actors and actresses, certain performance that they expect, a certain climax that they expect, certain uh, uh, many of the,、uh, the mainstream film elements that they all.、Uh, All of them expect to have and to, to 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 observe and to experience when they go to a cinema. So to me, I do think that it is hard to change this particular expectation.、Um, if you do want to change them, the way they see film, the way they do film and expect film, you do it one step at a time, slowly and gradually.、Uh, for me, I have been trying to do that for a long time, and I do find that there are. Indeed, cinephiles and a really smart, very very、um, reflective film viewers and film audience that they are very、uh, they 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 take options as something that is、uh, good, that something is new. They take innovation as something that they crave and they want. They want to see things not in a cookie cutter box. They want to. We see whether or not their films can be made outside the box, but these audience members they are few and far in between, and I have personally experienced that as I mentioned before, I、uh, made films in Taiwan, and of course this is where I live, and I do want to make sure that at least for the Taiwanese market I have certain 
level of a success in terms of box office. And that, that's the reason why I mentioned before that I spend a lot of efforts and time personally selling tickets in the streets to just make sure that I can support the, the screens and also the cinemas that uh, I want to uh, somehow present my film. And every single film, uh, I, I hit a plateau about around 10,000 tickets. And it's always like that. There, it's, there's no accumulated uh, outcome for all the efforts I have done year after year. It's just so that these viewers tend to, they come and they go. And then you have to somehow cultivate another group of new film viewers that can appreciate something that is innovative and something is new and something that is unconventional. So I do think that it has a lot to do with education, art education especially. And I can't help but comparing what's going on in Europe and the US and also with the rest of Asia. I do see that because of the environment that they were in for people in Europe and the United States, because of the, the, uh, the, the arts education and also the access to contemporary art museums, somehow they uh, have more access uh, to these different way of expressing yourself artistically, rather than uh, whereas in Asia, most of the people, they are so used to uh, films as an entertainment, as a very homogeneous way of thinking about film uh, that, uh, in terms of its purpose. So I do think that there's a big uh, disparity in terms of this type of visual aesthetics uh, cultivations and education among the viewers in Asia and in the United States and Europe. So I have been trying to think about uh, as the contemporary art museum started to grow in Asia, I, I start to think that maybe this is a, an opportunity for me to somehow uh, use film as a medium to and combine and collaborate with uh, art museum to think about whether or not film could be used and could be shown and could be part of the art education within the art museum setting. And that is why I have been doing what I uh, have been making in terms of the films, not only in terms of its uh, content, but also in the way that it is shown uh, in different venues and different environments. I think one very uh, striking thing about some of your earlier films is this intensely melancholic or nostalgic relationship with classic cinema. Think of Truffaut and Jean-Pierre Leo and What Time Is It There and King Who and Goodbye Dragon Inn and there's actually even a lovely Chaplin reference in, in the new film in Days. I'm just wondering if you can speak to the place that cinema occupies in his life today. He's clearly you know, somebody who had important formative experiences with cinema, but I'm wondering what role cinema plays in his life today. 一些影片都有一些影视啊或者一些引用像在那那边纪念中的里面有一些楚服的叫张佩里奥的这样子的连连续让您在不善里面有胡金天导演之前这个龙门客栈的这样的一个啊隐喻啊在这部片里面啊也
呃日本的电影我们看看到的只是商业的部分，可能小金啊啊黑泽明啊基本上是看不到的。那这个经验的呃过程是一直到我读大学的时候，我才有机会在台湾啊、呃、的电影图书馆。啊，或者是呃电影节啊，开始补充回呃以前的那些大师的作品，啊啊，甚至是呃呃另外的一些其他的上的的的怎么讲，就是说各个国家的电影呃开始可以看到印度的啊欧洲，特别是大量是欧洲的电影啊啊新浪潮的，你慢慢补足了电影的发展的概概念哈、啊，所以呃有一点点像是。呃，我后来投入到电影家族的时候，我是非常非常迷恋，啊、呃、啊、呃、那种更倾向于导演导演电影笔记的那种导演概念的，呃的的的电影，呃特别喜欢他们啊，呃在创作上是真的是深受影响，好、哦、受到影响，反而对商业片，呃自然自然的就没有这么大的兴趣了，好、哦，很可能早是。呃，年轻时候会会会很想拍一个商业的武侠片，后来反而就觉得说，啊、呃、啊、呃，逐渐脱离这种这种想法，啊、哦，就想拍个人创作。这个我的个人创作跟电影史是完全是非常密密切的，啊、哦，表达的方式也是依循着呃电影笔记那那个路线过来的，所以呃，我当然在。呃，我我我想是我的作品的本本本质。我的作品不是改编小说，呃，不是听一个动人的故事，不是要卖一个故事给观众，而是完全是啊、呃，我个人的成长的经历投射进去。所以有很多电影的部分会会加进来，这很自然的现现象。Everything that I have made so far is a reflection of my own viewing experience growing up. I grew up in a very small town in Malaysia. I remember that when I was three years old, my grandparents already took me to see films daily. And at the time,、uh, they were films from Hong Kong, from Hollywood, from Taiwan, and these are these were all commer commercial films that I watched. And at the time, I also have experience. Not so much as the Hong Kong, Hollywood, and Taiwan. Some European film,、uh, film from Japan. That these are mostly commercial films. The films more towards the art house ones from Ozu or Akira. They,、uh, I didn't have the opportunity to actually see them at the time. It is. It was not until when I went to Taiwan for my、uh, college education that I had the opportunity to go to film archive and film library. To start watching those films that I didn't have the access to, these were films that are、uh, made by masters. These are classics,、um, films not only from uh, the uh, all the countries I mentioned before, also from India. That I saw quite a few of them、uh, at that time. I also I had the opportunity to watch all the、uh, European New Wave films, and that really somehow filled the void and bridged the gaps. Of my own personal film、uh, development, in terms of the, along with the film histories that、uh, that I used to know, and there are certain holes and there are certain things that I didn't have the access to, and now suddenly became complete. And I very much uh, admire uh, the films made by those directors that、uh, somehow following the,、uh, the the passage and the the written records, the film histories. Of the film notebook、um, era, that these are the films that I really、uh, enjoy, and slowly I become less interested in making commercial films. I used to think about、uh, making Usha commercial films, but then after the access to these different type of classics and these、uh, works by masters, I start to realize that th these are the films. This,、uh, these are kind, the kind of film that I want to make as a filmmaker. So it is an intentional、uh, effort that I made to somehow slowly gravitate away from the narrative structure, the narrative components of what does it mean to make films. And、uh, to me, it is very much to somehow capture and to reflect my own personal 
experience growing up and my own personal experience just um, getting older. And I think that because of that type of going, uh, staying away from the narrative and really trying to just capture the true essence of who I am as a person and my uh, daily experience uh, growing up, getting older, and naturally these type of movie will show up in my films because that is indeed part of my personal experience uh, as a viewer and as an audience. I'm curious about contemporary films too, too but whether he, whether you, do you watch new movies or is it the, these can, this is, do you go back to the canon of films that you referenced or do you continue to discover new work that, that interests you? 那对于现在当代的电影呢<笑> 不是重复就还是在去挖掘作品非常言之有物我们真的是没有比得上老一辈的那些电影人 I do watch contemporary films, but uh, I have to say that I tend not to remember their names uh, or the, the director's names, just because I guess I'm getting older. Uh, but I do uh, still constantly exploring old films. And uh, those are the films that will continue to find new way to interpret them and to, to feel them and to, to really be moved by them. I remember that uh, almost a year that I spent time watching films, uh, the Hong Kongese films from the 50s online. And these are the films that actually uh, came before me, before I was born. But I found that a lot of the films um, made in Hong Kong in the 50s, they were, they were very, very meaningful. And uh, a lot of family dramas that were very, very captivating. And I found them enjoyable. So I do think that this is uh, something that I just gravitate towards more so than the contemporary films. And I do also think that in comparison, our generation as filmmakers to compare to the older generation as filmmakers, I, I do think that uh, I, I, I do think that they did it uh, much better than we are doing right now uh, for the reason that even though that these older generation masters and filmmakers, they they also experience commercial pressures and in that particular commercial environment, but you still see a lot of our tours, a lot of individualized uh, filmmakings and people keep true to themselves, even with the commercial pr pressures at the time. So I really think that that is also one of the reasons why I tend to gravitate more towards the old films rather than the, uh, the contemporary films, but I do watch them. I'm going to ask, I'm just going to ask one question about days because I should tell people that we've recorded a, a Q&A, which is available um, if you, if you watch the film. Uh, and the Q&A about days is also on YouTube where we speak more specifically about that film. But I do have one question about it. 
um, that I, I, I thought it would be good to bring up now, which is this, um, the film has a, 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 a more than 30 minute um, scene of a massage uh, that takes place, a scene of intimacy between two men in a hotel room. Um, and it's very striking, I think, in um, director Sai's body of work. Um, he has had many, there, there are many long extended shots, extended sequences. There are many scenes of sex and sexual release. Um, but those scenes often have an, um, this sort of edge of, of transgression to them. This, this scene is really striking for its tenderness, its extreme tenderness. Uh, and I'm wondering how he sees this particular scene of sexual intimacy fitting in with the many other memorable scenes of, of, of sexual contact and intimacy that are in his work.那之前导演一直以来拍摄电影的时候從以前的電影到這次日子裡面透過這樣子的一個按摩的場景來處理這件事情。要跟題材的關係吧,因為每一次拍到性的時候剛好都是不太愉快的。我甚至拍過像河流這樣的父子之間在暗中不知道彼此的身份都看起來都不太愉快我的性的處理但是基本上是很強烈的這次是因為有一種那他也是有一點像偷情的狀態两个都是一个演得非常好感覺每个人的感受都不太一样
，我们就在里面拍摄，所以所以呃，整个状态是非常轻轻松的，在进行这场按摩，也就是我想要的一个一个效果了。So I do think that has a lot to do with the characters that uh, uh, that you saw and observed with these sex scenes, and that's the reason why you see this uh, dramatic departure from, from the transgressions that you mentioned before. Uh, it was for the old films, the previous films, the, the sex scenes tend to be in, a, in very unpleasant situations and environments, and also with very unpleasant characters and when I say unpleasant means that these are the people who are either experiencing a certain um, scenario of being cheated or cheating on someone whether or not this is in the uh, environment of uh, mass debating or environment of or the context of the father and son without knowing each other and have that kind of ancestral a relationship or that this could be in a pleasant in terms of in the context of ailing body uh, dealing with sex so I do think that that was uh, sort of came with the characters that are and the, the narratives that I want to serve whereas this particular uh, scene uh, for days I do think that there's certain mental preparation for the actors acting out this particular massage scene because of the fact that even though that it, on some level, this might be also cheating, quote unquote, but at the same time, there is this transactional element to it that they all, both of them, they both expect that certain things will happen, including the, the release at the end and the, the process of getting massage. And I do think that for most of us or uh, just, uh, ordinary people like us, which when we uh, make love, there are certain emotional burdens and um, baggage that we carry with us. Whereas if this is purely transactional, as pretty much ex experienced by these two characters, suddenly it became more enjoyable because you don't have to worry about any type of emotional burdens and baggage because the act of intimacy, it is, purely for enjoyment and it is purely transactional. So I do think that not only uh, it is because of the context they are in that make it different from the previous films, I also think that acting wise, these two actors, they did a very good job uh, trying to express uh, the, the intimacy that uh, these two lonely people experience. Uh, at this uh, within this particular short duration of time, even though that it is 30 minutes long, I do think that if you can let your guard down, you will also be massaged uh, while watching this particular sequence because of the the technique these Laotian masseur they use. It is not just massaging the the people or the the client that they're massaging. They, it almost as if that they're massaging every single person who is observing and also witnessing this particular uh, process. So, as I said, um, if you let it happen and really observe and really feel every every single movement, you will also uh, be massaged and be relaxed by uh, these uh, this type of human connection through the uh, techniques of massage. And I do think that is also uh, the reason why this particular scene was so powerful and so therapeutic, uh, not only for the actors involved, but also for the viewers. And I remember when we shot this scene, we spent the whole day uh, and it was a very, very enjoyable day and ex enjoyable experience. We didn't tell anyone, including the hotel staff, that we were there to make films. We just simply check in without telling anyone. And when we start filming this particular scene, and I think the, and it, those are actual rooms that we stay in. And we, I, and then as a result, I do think that it came across as really relaxed and are really natural uh, in terms of the way they connect with each other. It's very, it's very true. Um, I'm gonna take one, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'll start um, 
uh, drawing from uh, the audience questions that have been submitted. Uh, I feel like I have to ask you a question about time since time is kind of the, the subject and the form of, of many of your films. Um, I'm thinking back to the documentary um, Afternoon uh, from 2015, which is basically a long conversation between you and Li Kang Sheng. And one of the things that um, you say, one of, the, one of the topics that comes up is this idea of how your sense of time changes as you get older. Um, and I'm wondering if that idea can be carried over to his films. Like does the sense of time in the films change too? Um, and I'm also thinking that one other thing that changes our sense of time is illness. Um, and whether, since, it's, since the films have become to a large degree about the aging body and the ailing body, um, whether the focus on illness has altered the work with duration, the sense of time in the films. Na 对于时间感这个方面也有一些改变就是在时间感上面你的身体变得比较迟钝当然怎么讲呢我的电影有一个特质就是希望看起来非常真实通常电影的这种叙事的方式其实是比较戏剧性的它竟然不不呃呃时间都比较比较快的感觉，可是我我发现说呃怎么讲，我我的电影并不并不在表达这些表表现这些戏剧的一一些效果，所以通常呃都是生活的状态啊，所以有很多是是需要时间来来酝
啊，我我喜欢那个无聊，因为它太真实了啊，所以常常你看我的影片，有很多时候是好像很有意思，突然间又很没有意思，突然间又有一点意思。如果没有那个无聊在里面的话，它不会产生这种效果。So as I mentioned before, my films are very much uh, ref uh, a reflection of my personal and individual experience. And just like everybody else, I will also go through the natural process of aging and getting sick, getting slower, getting more sensitive to my own health. So I, I think that is the reason uh, why that you see the progressions of how I deal with these issues in the most natural way. I really strive for films that can capture uh, something that is real and something that is authentic. And those are the, the most important things I want to uh, present in my films. So I do think that if you think about most of the film productions or even stage productions, that it's always about serving the dramatic narratives. And to me, uh, I, that's not my film. That's not what I want to capture. I don't want to have that kind of dramatic effects in my films. And what I'm trying to capture is the realness, the authenticity, and that takes time in order to see that and to show that uh, through that kind of uh, capture, the daily routine or daily movement, daily ritual in a long span of time. And I do think as a, as a viewer, if you can open yourself up for this type of long and meaningful intense gaze and to really start reflecting on and experiencing the, the daily rituals or movements that you make in real time, the same way that you watch the, these behaviors and these rituals being performed in real time on screen, somehow you can not only see things more clear, uh, you can also enjoy your own thoughts and your own feelings about what you just observed of this particular long take during this particular long period of time. And I do think that uh, these long duration or long takes might seem meaningless or empty, uh, but and some people might also find it boring, but these are all calculated components and elements that intentionally put in so that I can achieve that sense of realness and that sense of authenticity. So I have a long time to do this in the film. There is a lot of time to do this. There is a lot of time to do this. There is a lot of time to do this. There is a lot of time to do this. So it will create a very different way 习惯的那种节奏，哦，可是那通常都是有生活经验的人，他会感觉到那是一个真实的节奏，啊、呃，就会在我的影片里面出现。嗯。So during the post-production editing process, that is when I then have to decide how much boringness I want to put in to somehow balance and. Complement the meaningful parts of the film so that I can capture that sense of authenticity and realness. And I do think that uh, the end result usually uh, is something that will test the patience of ordinary viewers and, and the ordinary uh, audience because that they are so used to a certain tempo and certain way of processing information. But I do think that there are more sensitive viewers and more uh, reflective viewers that they somehow see this type of too long or too boring, too empty scenes as something that capture the true essence of uh, their, not only the character's life, but they also their own lives. So I'm gonna start um, drawing from the audience questions uh, and looking through them now, there are actually three questions about a specific scene in day. So I feel like I have to pose this. Uh, it's the, um, I'm going to read um, one of them. This is from Braden King, who says he saw the film at the Brooklyn drive-in. 
it was breathtaking, especially with all the boats passing through New York Harbor behind the screen. I gasped when I saw the shot of the mostly opaque windows of the cat wandering through, just barely visible behind the fogged glass. Could you talk a bit about that shot, how it came about, what it means to you in terms of the film as a whole? Thank you for all your intensely inspiring work. That's a question from an anonymous attendee that references that scene and wants to know if it was planned. And there's a question from Ruby Wang, who wants to know about the silence in that scene and how you think about um, sound in your films. So three questions all about that particular scene.一到就是那场猫的那场戏选择用这样的方式来表达这场戏<笑> 飞机的建筑物里面剪接的时候就发现了纸猫三风雨欲来是有一点吵的它毕竟就是一个电影，它是可以处理的。哦，呃，像这种无声的画面，在我的其他影片偶尔也会出现过。哦，这次是在这个地方出现。So uh, first of all, I want to say how happy I am to know that some of you actually saw the cat. Uh, because if you didn't pay attention, you probably would just miss it all together. And um, actually, when we shot this particular uh, sequence, we didn't see the cat either. We took a very, very long shot of the sunset in an old dilapidated building with the window uh, outside in Bangkok uh, location. And I didn't know how I'm going to use this footage at all. At the time, I just thought, that this is beautiful and I want to deposit this particular image into my archive for future use. And it is not until later on during post-production when we were editing the film that we saw the cat and we thought that was such an, an interesting and 
playful elements to add into it. Uh, it represents another lonely being in the urban jungle of Bangkok. And I do also think that this is such a purely visual scene that I want to present and therefore I just completely make it silent uh, without a sound. And that is a way for me to foreshadow what it's about what is about to come and what is about to happen before the two characters. And it is a very effective way of setting that, the next scene up. And I do also think that while my film, uh, of course, is unsubtitled and without dialogue, but it's a very, very noisy film because I intentionally include a lot of background noise, a lot of ambient noises, and sometimes even amplified the, uh, the background and um, uh, ambient noises, just to create an, a certain texture to this particular film. And part of what's so unique about film is that you can actually treat your sound the same way that you can treat your uh, images. So to make that sound disappear uh, can really uh, create almost present this type of dream state that I want to create to set up the, and foreshadow the next scenes to come. And that is the reason why uh, you also see uh, silence in my other films uh, used with the same purpose and intention. We're at the hour mark, but I'm just gonna try to squeeze in um, another question. There are actually several questions also um, that are all about uh, Li Kangsheng uh, and the working relationship. Um, I'm gonna read Gary Kramer's, um, um, which is specifically about how that working relationship has changed over such a long period of collaboration. And let me throw in one actually, uh, one, other, uh, one other sort of uh, extra <laughs> layer to that question, because in the, in the uh, Q&A for days, um, you talked about how you met Anong, um, the actor from Laos. I'm actually curious if you can tell us how you met Li Kangsheng too, and, how, and then how that relationship has changed. Now,在来的问题是我关于跟李康生之间这么多年来合作的这样一个关系,这么多年合作拍片之后,那你们之间合作互动方式是不是有些改变?那改变的方式是在哪里?那另外也想了解一下, 您有提到说在当初在日子的做提问的时候有提到跟杨龙是在曼谷的一个餐饮面遇见那你们提到是当初怎么遇到李康生的遇到李康生应该大家都知道吧我是在九一年要拍一个电视单元剧一个电视短
，没有说什么的就拍了。比如说他在香港的街头走路，啊、呃，就要从啊、呃、尖沙咀走到。油麻地哈、哦，这一大段路很长，大概要走半小时，他他就走，我们就一直拍，他就一直走，哦，呃，几乎是几乎是没有没有提示的，没有任何提示的啊、哦，他想停下来抽烟，我们就跟着停下来，大概就这样子，呃呃，甚至有他跟弄的按摩的戏也是，就非常简单，呃呃，都。基基本上就是就是拍就对了啊，大概是这样，因为我我对他有太熟悉了，嗯，那跟跟诺呢，呃，也是非常有趣的认识，呃，就是呃，大概几年前我我去泰国旅行，在一个餐厅遇到他，然后也是他的外形吸引我，我不知道为什么，就是可能是一种缘分哦、啊，所以我们就认识了啊。后来的交往几乎是通过私讯的，用手机的私讯来交往，所以我从那个私讯里面看到他的部分的呃生活，觉得非常有意思，就去拍他。So I met Li Kangsheng in 1991. At the time, I was making a TV series, and I was looking for and trying to cast a rebellious youth、uh, as a character. And I remember that day. I, I just finished watching a film in the in the theater. It's a David, a David Lynch film. And I, as I walked out, I saw this particular young person sitting on a motorcycle. And、uh, at the time, it turned out that、uh, it turns out that at the time he was working for a gambling video arcade, and he was the lookout. Uh, and that's the reason why he was holding onto a walkie-talkie so that he can actually report back whatever when the police、uh, comes or trying to、uh, raid the place. So that that was, and I, I just found him、uh, fit the mode and the the appearance or the characters that I was looking for, and I struck up a conversation, and that's how he became my actor and continue. The collaboration for many many years、uh, after that particular encounter, and I do think that in terms of our collaboration and the ev evolutions and the changes、uh, throughout the years, is that now unlike before, I need to somehow teach and direct him how to get into certain emotional states and how to express those emotional states. Now I don't have to do that at all. I become very, very relaxed and just let him do whatever he thinks is the best for that particular scene.、Uh, for example, for the work, the Walker series, that the short films I made of him just walking、uh, in busy urban streets, I will never just say、uh, no good. That start over because every single Long take will be about 30 minutes, and that's going to take another 30 minutes to capture that natural state that I want him to present、uh, in these Walker series. So I just let him walk from point A to point B, however he wants to uh, walk uh, during that particular time and space. And since I'm so familiar with his methods or his way of working,、uh, I didn't give. Him any note or any instructions for the scene that say、uh, to walk in the streets of Hong Kong from one point to the next about thirty minutes apart, and I just say walk from here to here, and then he did. He might stop to smoke a cigarette. We will then stop, wait for him, but we keep the camera rolling and、uh, in an, a long. Uninterrupted take, and same with the massage scene that you saw in the film. Uh, also, uh, I didn't give any notes or any type of direction. I just set up the scenario very, very briefly, and then I trust him, and I know how he's going to work with the, within that particular space. As、uh, far as Anong Hong Shangsi. Uh, I met him、uh, in one of the trips I took to Thailand, and he was working in a restaurant. And 
I think there's just some an air and about him and the appearance and the the way he looks just somehow capture me and then I started to get to know him uh, through video conferencing started to know a lot of about his daily lives and I found them fascinating and I would like to capture them and deposit into the archive I mentioned before. I actually I'm going to squeeze in one more. I'm going to take because I feel feel bad the audience hasn't been able to ask the questions. I don't, there are a lot of good ones here. So if you don't mind, I'll throw. Um, there are two questions about your sort of return from retirement. I think a lot of people had assumed that you had retired from, not retired, but retired from filmmaking maybe. Um, and what, whether the, and I think people are, are a little anxious about this maybe and, and hopeful that you've changed your mind. Um, and also, um, Andrew Jacob references the documentary Afternoon that I mentioned and said that you, you talked about retiring in that film, but you're looking younger and healthier than ever, and, uh, whether you've found uh, new inspirations uh, in, in, in the years since. So it's just that, just that as, a, as a concluding question. Uh 那可是看你现在越来越年轻越来越有活力很难脱离他我说的那个家族就是像类似像新浪潮厨夫这种概念甚至会有时候会厌烦不见得那么舒服所以我不是一个积极的导演我不是那种每天写的案子想着有很多电影要拍我是一个被动的导演可能从开始我就是这样我都是人家来找我拍戏我就给了我一笔钱我就忽然间知道要拍什么了是自动的
呃，我我觉得我我我完全是顺着我的命运在走的一个一个导演，比如说我的命运把我拉到有美术馆的面向的概念，哎，我又有一些活力出来，哦，我又觉得哎，呃，可以很自由的在做自己喜欢做的事情，哦，可以做这样的选择，大概是一个这样的情况吧。所以，所以，呃，我我可以跟你们讲说，我们目前走到一个状态是，我常常都是脑袋一片空白的，可是我手上。有一些 case 要处理，比如说短片，好几个短片，我今年拍了三四个短片，还没有公开的，哦，都是一片空白的情况去拍的，只是有一点想法，哦，就去拍了。我发现我已经变成不是一个坐在家里想想剧情的一个导演，好、哦，想怎么拍摄的导演，我必须要呃带着我的一个很简单的，所以我必须要简单，我的摄影组很简单，我一个收音的一个摄影的，我就去拍了，啊、哦。拍我的要拍的那个对象，我从拍里面发现的，呃，我想拍的东西，而而不是我想象我想拍什么我去拍什么，我是去发现的这样的一个概念，所以我有一点在现现阶段，我有一点回到我像一个电影的小学生，好、哦，重新洗牌，前面所有的习惯圈几乎都被推翻掉，都不喜欢了，都不想那样拍了，啊、哦。包括我将来想再拍小康，我也是全面洗牌，说怎么拍他，啊啊啊，或者安诺这个新的演员进来，我要想我要怎么拍他，啊，才才是才能够表达我想，呃，表达对生命的一些想法，大概是这样子吧。所以我有一些，呃，这个过程其实是来的非常自然，它不是我刻意去想的，它是很自然就来了，很自然使到我没有办法去处理。那种很多人的电影，呃，很自然的使到我必须要回到一个简朴的一种状态，大概都是这样子来的，嗯，所以我现在也很难说我接着要做什么，但是我可以说我最近手上正在拍几个短片，也拍完了，在做后期，很可能明年你们又看到我又有作品了啊，我说我不要拍，可是我又会出现一些作品出来，大概是这样子吧，因为我的去处变得比较宽广。广一点，我可以去戏院，我可以去美术馆，我可以呃呃做我想做的事情，这样子。嗯 ，I really see myself as a member of the film family, and it is hard to escape. And when I say family, I meant I'm part of this family, a long line of a tour filmmakers, part、uh, such as. Just like the new waves, truthful as part of that particular family, I feel very much part of that family as well, and that's the reason why I was、uh, tired of a lot of the, the habits of making films and the aftermath of facing the pressures and the the market mechanism and all the interviews that I have to deal with, and I became. Very, very fatigued, and also didn't find pleasure out of、uh, all that particular mode of production that I was in. And I am not a very, very product、um, proactive filmmakers.、Uh, in fact, I can say that I'm very passive in a way that I don't have a lot of production plans that I plan to make films, and these are the films and ideas, the scripts that I have, and I want to make them happen and make it into reality. I that's not how I make film. I usually make films because someone approached me with the funding, and then asked me and commissioned me to make certain films, whether or not this is the river, whether or not it's the whole, the film、uh, that I made, what time it is there. It's very much part of the process that、uh, it just、uh, so happened that someone approached me with this particular opportunities, and I naturally just came up with ideas of the films that I want to make、uh, to somehow、uh, answer this particular invitation. It it wasn't pre-planned. It's not as if that I have all the Films lined up that I want to make, and then look for fundings to fund those films. So I do think that it is the market that、uh, I was I grew tired of. It is that kind of pressure and all the other unpleasant habits that I used to、uh, 
perform or used to do that somehow make me realize that maybe it's time not to do this anymore. I'm a, I always have this dilemma. I feel so conflicted. On the one hand, I really see uh, my creative expression can be best presented through the medium of film. But at the same time, I also feel and grew tired of the industry. And that was the, the conflicted part of me saying that I didn't, I'm not gonna make any more films. Uh, it's because of that. So I do think that uh, things might have changed a little bit just because right now I feel as if that I, I'm just going with the flow and I'm destined, uh, almost fated, to actually still make films because suddenly I have a different venue for me to present my creative works through museums, through other uh, way, uh, mediums or media uh, in order for me to somehow uh, have that kind of creative outlet. And I always think of myself as someone who is the, the current situation. I always think about myself as completely clear-headed and also empty in such a way that it, it, it opens up for many, many different possibilities. And just to share with you that this, this particular year, I already finished three to four short films. Right now, it's, uh, they're in post-production. So uh, it's not as if that I am I'm constantly thinking about the, the narratives or the plot lines or the films I want to make. They, they just happen naturally. And I'm still working, I'm still making films. And especially now knowing that I have other uh, venues to show my works that give me even more uh, incentive and motivation to, to make films. And I do think that uh, right now, the same way I talk about depositing those uh, images into archives, I don't come up with plot lines that, that I want to shoot. Instead, I'm now actively involved in collecting images that I might be able to use in the future. And by doing so, I only recruited and also worked with a very small group of people, a cinematographer, a sound person, and that will be the crew that I will put together to start depositing and exploring different images that I would like to save and archive. And almost as if that, as a filmmaker, I now have went back to the, the elementary school of filmmaking, somehow relearning everything and subverting, uh, subverting everything that I have done in the past and trying to find a new way to express myself. The same way with, uh, in terms of Li Kangshen and Anang, I also want to somehow find a different way to capture them, to make films about them. But the quintessential qualities I want to maintain in all my film will be as natural as possible, as simple as possible. And those are the only reasons why I will continue to make films. So just to clarify, you finished three or four short films this year, shot, shot during the pandemic? Mm. Yes. Yeah, we <laughs> Very productive. Wow. Um, it's great to know some of us have had a productive quarantine. Uh, that's exciting. Um, I think that's a good note to end on because that's, that's what we all wanted to hear, that, you're, that you are continuing to make work. Um, I'm just going to end by saying that there's an outpouring of expressions of gratitude and appreciation for your work and for this new film um, in the chat. So. Um, Thank you so much for, for this film, for your work, and for being part of the festival this year. Thank you. Thank you. 沒有很多那種元素是大家習慣的,所以在西城看到底是什麼感覺,我非常好奇,而且有點擔心。Very <笑> curious, you know, concerns about what's it like to watch my film in a driving. 
because I tend to think that the, my film will be best shown in an enclosed setting because there are so many details. Yeah. That, um, that this. Yeah. Okay. We. <laughs> As soon as cinema's open, we'll do that. Um, but you know, the, the observation about the cat was uh, from, from Braden who watched it at the drive-in. So I think uh, some very attentive viewers here. And uh, a friend of mine actually translated some of the reviews and articles uh, of people after they watched the film in drive-ins the other day. And they seem to enjoy the film and a lot of positive reactions. So I'm very glad to know that. And thank you very much for the support. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Vincent, thank you. Amazing. Even by our standards. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thanks all for being with us.